Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dwyer and this is the Norman Invasion Part 20. My enemy's enemy is still my enemy. This show takes us into the 1190s where the Norman Invasion starts to move towards what might be called the end game. This final phase takes a few decades but the Normans start to push into areas where they had previously had little influence. This is the most complex and fascinating part of the invasion, so I'm going to devote three or possibly four shows to the 1190s alone before we move on. This episode sets the scene by looking in detail at events in Munster, somewhere I feel I've neglected in the series so far. The next episode will move north into Connacht before we head on towards Ulster. Today's show will give us a unique insight into the medieval mindset, and particularly that of the Gaelic kings, who are on the receiving end of the invasion, but who sometimes act with what seems like a suicidal attitude to the Normans, who are hell-bent on destroying them. By 1190, Donal O'Brien, the King of Thomond, was unique. He was the only Gaelic king still ruling in Ireland who had been in power in the days prior to the arrival of the Normans, which was quite an achievement. By the closing years of the 12th century, the Norman invasion was now nearly a generation old, but still Donal managed to cling to power. Across Ireland, sons and heirs of the original invaders were carrying forward the work of conquest and settlement as they inherited their father's estates. Indeed, increasingly, there were few people like Donal who could remember Ireland before the tumultuous events of the 1170s. Slowly but surely the Normans were becoming part and parcel of life on the island and it was increasingly difficult to envisage an Ireland without them. They controlled all major towns and increasingly had the backing of the church. They were building castle after castle and taking control of millions of acres of land. Indeed men like Strongbow were now in the pantheon of greats of Irish history alongside the likes of Donal's great-great-great-grandfather Brian Boru. Whether he was there as a hero or a villain just depended on your perspective on the invasion. Donal was almost a relic of a bygone world by the 1190s. The centuries-old kingdom of Leinster he would have known as a youth was no more. It was now a Norman lordship, as was Meath and Eastern Ulster. By the late 12th century, it seemed increasingly likely as well that Thomond was about to go this way too. However, as the Normans circled his kingdom, Donal and his family reacted in the most unusual manner. And to understand why they engaged in what sometimes seems like a suicidal course of action, we need to look deep into their history in the preceding decades. Donal's family, the O'Briens, had been ruling the region of Thomond since about the mid-10th century, when Brian Boru had dragged them from obscurity. Six generations later, Donal rose to power, just as the first Normans landed in Ireland. His father, Mwokertach, had died in 1167, when Morris de Prendergast led the first wave of Norman mercenaries to Ireland. However, Donal hadn't paid much attention to Morris and his few companions. They didn't last long before leaving Ireland, and Donal had more pressing matters anyway. He was locked in the most deadly of feuds. His father's death had triggered the inevitable struggle for succession within his family. He eventually did rise to power, but not before his brother was murdered by his cousin, who was in turn murdered by other relatives. This violence did not end with Donal's inauguration either. In the coming years, Donal himself blinded two other brothers, who he perceived as a threat. These struggles for succession, integral to life in Gaelic Ireland and people's sense of honour, were highly important as the Normans advanced into the West, and I will come back to these later in the show. No less important were the regional feuds between families that dominated politics. In Ulster, the O'Neills and McLaughlins, for example, had been at war since about 1050. For Donal, it was the McCarthy family he struggled against. They controlled the southern half of Munster, the Kingdom of Desmond, and warfare between the McCarthys and the O'Briens was all-consuming for both families. Even when the Normans exploded on the scene in 1170, and their rapid conquest of Leinster triggered alarm bells, you might think both families would put aside their feud. However, they remained fixated on their local struggle. To understand why they did this, we need to look at the worldview of Donal O'Brien and his Gaelic-Irish contemporaries. 
Ireland as we know it did not exist in this period. For Donald O'Brien, he would not have seen himself as an Irish person, per se. The most important thing in his life was the extended O'Brien family and his dominance over it. His mother country, if I can use this modern term, was the Kingdom of Thomond in North Munster. His life was rooted in this local landscape and the history of his forefathers. The political entity he lived and might potentially die for was his extended family, not Ireland. Therefore, he didn't particularly have any concern what happened in other kingdoms if it didn't impact Thomond. It's not that different from the way that you might observe events in other countries. Therefore, when a Norman army started intervening in Leinster, he certainly would not have seen this as some infringement of sovereignty in the way that it would be viewed today. Indeed, initially he seems to have viewed the Normans as potential allies. When Henry II arrived in 1171, Donald submitted to him. His consideration here again, however, was intensely local. He feared Henry might help his deadly rivals, the McCarthys, who had already submitted to the king. Nevertheless, in the coming decades of chaos that followed the invasion of Ireland, Donal emerged as one of the most successful Gaelic kings at maintaining his power. To say he resisted the Normans doesn't tell the full story, because his goal was purely focused on preserving himself, his family and Thomond. So this saw him make deals with the Normans when that worked. On other occasions he fought them, and on other occasions still, he fought for them. This diversity of tactics was seen in his early interactions with them. When Henry II arrived, he handed over the port of Limerick to the king's officials. However, in 1172, when Henry had left and Norman armies tried to move into his zone of influence, he burned the newly erected castle of Kilkenny. In the following year, he joined the O'Connors to defeat the Normans at the Battle of Thurlis as they appeared to be encroaching on his territory. His consideration through all these events, though, was always Thomond. He didn't want anyone encroaching on his lands, be they Norman or Gaelic Irish. The first concerted threat to Munster came, as we saw in Part 15, in 1177, when Henry II granted a large portion of the region, including territories in both Donald's kingdom of Thomond and that of his rivals, the McCarthys in Desmond, to Norman lords. This, we might think, would finally force the two to work together, or at least call a cessation of the feud. But this was the least likely outcome in the 12th century. Whatever antipathy the McCarthys and the O'Briens felt for the Normans paled in comparison to the level of animosity they had for each other. Indeed, the arrival of large Norman forces in the region was exclusively seen through the prism of their local feud, and Donal O'Brien actually aided the Norman army of Robert Fitzstephen, Philip de Brioge and Milo de Cogan when they invaded the McCarthy's kingdom of Desmond. The short-sightedness of this policy was revealed when the Normans immediately turned on Donal and tried to invade Thomond after they had secured their foothold in Desmond. However, even though they were divided, the kingdoms of Munster put up a tremendous resistance to the Normans, as we shall see next. Now, let's get back to the show. As we saw in part 15 of the series, when the Normans tried to invade Thomond after defeating the McCarthys in late 1177, Donal organised a ruthless defence of the region. Rather than allow the city of Limerick fall, he burned it to the ground, and the Normans, already having fought one campaign in the southwest that year, balked at the prospect of not having a secure base of operations and withdrew. Meanwhile, Robert Fitzstephen and Milo de Cogan soon found that controlling the lands they had taken from the McCarthys in Desmond would be hard going. Successive McCarthy kings, Donal O'Brien's bitter rivals, gained a ferocious reputation. By the 1180s, the reigning king in Desmond, another Donal, Donal McCarthy, was described as the most feared by the foreigners and the Gael by a somewhat complimentary source. McCarthy was responsible for the assassination of Robert Fitzstephen's son and heir. In 1189, he went on to illustrate how he was not a man to be trifled with when he launched a raid eastwards, destroying castles as far as Waterford. When the Normans retaliated, he counterattacked, capturing Geoffrey de Cogan and flayed him alive. Flaying is the act of skinning a human being. However, while he was resisting the Normans himself, Donald O'Brien did not necessarily welcome these McCarthy victories. He saw little or no difference between the Normans and his bitter rivals. They were all outsiders trying to take his power and a rise of the McCarthys 
was not good news. Although the Norman presence in Munster waned in the late 1170s, things began to change after 1185. That year, Prince John arrived in Ireland on his disastrous visit. However, his only effective action took place in Munster. There he seized most of modern County Waterford and built several castles, establishing a region as a royal base from where the Normans could control Munster. John had also granted lands stretching as far as Limerick in Donal's kingdom to three Normans, William Burke, who will become important in our story, Theobald Butler and Philip of Worcester. While John's original plan had not been a full conquest, in the coming years this newly established base in 1185 was used for this purpose. Initially, despite the grants of land in Donald's kingdom, few settlements were actually built by the Normans. However, it does appear that William Burke made small encroachments, but nothing that amounted to a conquest. The major push, however, did begin in 1192, when the Normans brought to bear the full force of the colony and struck deep into Donald's territory of atonement. What specifically prompted this action is not clear. It may relate to the fact that John de Courcy, who had been the king's representative in Ireland since 1185, was replaced by Peter Pippard and William Le Petit. De Courcy, with his lands in the north, probably had little interest in Munster, but Pippard and Le Petit had different priorities. Whatever their motivation was, as has been shown on a few occasions now, once the Normans mobilised all their forces and could isolate a rival, they were unassailable. The Normans arrived into Thomond in strength and faced no real opposition and successfully crossed the Shannon River at Killaloo. This was the spiritual home of the O'Briens. Indeed, it was from here, at Killaloo, that Brian Baru had ruled from. However, Donald did not have the capacity to repel such a force. Nevertheless, he was a politically savvy individual and knew the dangers of submitting to the Normans and the weakness that this illustrated. He simply would not and could not bend the knee before these conquerors. As we have seen though, the idea of appealing for help to the McCarthys just wasn't an option. If you think about it, he was never going to receive a positive outcome. In 1177, he had attacked the McCarthys as the Normans invaded their homeland. He had, on occasion, worked with the O'Connors to his north, but they were embroiled in their own internal war at this point and in no position to lend aid. So, instead, he cut a deal with the Norman invaders. He offered his daughter's hand in marriage to the leading Norman in North Munster, William Burke. While it preserved his kingdom, whether he liked to acknowledge it or not, Don O'Brien was finally implicitly accepting the Normans were now a feature of life in Thomond. But for Donald, this was definitely more palatable than giving his hated rival in Desmond power over him. This clearly illustrated his worldview. He did not see his current struggle as a two-way conflict between him and the Normans, but rather as a three-way struggle between the Normans, himself and the McCarthys. In 1193, having forged the marital alliance with Burke, he gave the Normans permission to build a castle on Breckenish Island in the Shannon Estuary. The reason here was telling. Donald had done this, according to one source, to have, and I quote, a check on McCarthy. While today this would be seen as a treacherous act, perhaps, in 1192 it would have been seen as nothing of the sort. Donald was just defending his interests. Indeed, the Normans, even though they had conquered most of the island, were still seen as something of a lesser threat than the McCarthys were. All of Donald's Machiavellian dealings worked well while he was in power, but its limits and implicit weakness was revealed when Donald finally died in 1194. While he had more or less preserved Tormund intact through the invasion, he left the kingdom in a precarious position. The Normans were now on the doorstep, possibly even with one foot in the door, while his sons now began the customary age-old Gaelic tradition of the struggle of succession, and this had disastrous implications. There were three main contenders to succeed Donal. These were his sons, Murktoch Finn, Red Connor and Dunnocka. The main priority for each was to stop the other taking control while also stopping the McCarthys taking advantage of their weakness if they were at war with each other. The fear of Norman expansion, without doubt the greatest threat in retrospect, was very much a distant third consideration. Naturally, the Normans were able to take advantage of this situation. They massively expanded their presence in Thomond in the 1190s. Firstly, the three O'Brien rivals could not agree on who should take control of the town of Limerick 
and bizarrely they agreed to give it to the Normans who took control of the town by at the very latest 1197. The Norman authorities followed this land grab by granting land around the city to several more Norman families. Still however the O'Briens vying for the kingship of Thomond did not respond but remained focused on their struggle with each other. Initially Morkatok Finn took power but then his brother Red Connor sought help from the Normans and deposed him. While such squabbling seems ridiculous to us, there was nothing more important to these men than becoming king. This was not only important in terms of their individual prestige, but also in terms of their descendants. For each of the O'Brien brothers, if they failed to become king, the implications for their family could be disastrous. They could even be possibly murdered. Also, all three men had grown up waiting for this moment to come all their lives. The idea of standing aside would have been an insult to both their ancestors and descendants, and in a society so fixated on family honour, it was just unthinkable. They viewed the Normans as outsiders, and therefore, bizarrely, somehow less of a threat. No one seemed to realise that the Normans were playing their own game, one that would render the position of King of Thomond meaningless. So it was, by the year 1200, the Normans, who had been held at bay for more or less two decades, had their tentacles deep into Thomond. They soon were looking south at the prospect of further conquests into the territory of the O'Brien's rivals, the McCarthy's of Desmond. Here again, the age-old divisions of Gaelic Ireland saw the Normans advance. Depressingly, the only issue that united the O'Brien's in this period was to attack the McCarthy's, and in 1201, all three factions who were at war with each other united to support a renewed Norman assault on Desmond. Needless to say, amidst such short-sightedness, the Normans advanced in what was a comparatively bloodless conquest in Munster. While the region was not completely settled, the Norman presence was now massively expanded and growing with each year. The future in Ireland was bleak. The O'Briens and the McCarthys were not unique in this manner, and in the coming episodes we will see the O'Connors and the O'Neills both impacted by similar divisions. The Gaelic Irish were obsessed with obsolete traditions based around family honour and could not see that the world around them was being destroyed. This is all ahead of us in coming shows. Until next time, Slán. So